Now, most left-wing ideas are based upon the idea that we're a tabula rasa, that we're a sheet of paper, that society is, that you can write upon it as you want and as you will. That we're the product of economics, or we're the product of social forces, or interconnections of the two. There might be a bit of biology, but it's so mediated through socioeconomic concerns that it's lost sight of. Certainly, there are no prior truths to us and our existence. Hence Sartre's famous essay, which was designed to bring leftist students and a whole generation of them, many of whom are prominent in the media now and so on, in the Western world into a particular type of thinking, he wrote an essay called Existentialism is a Humanism, because ultimately, in a sense, it is. Although, paradoxically, there have been plenty of right-wing existentialists. They believe that existence precedes essence. Essence is just an idea, is a ghost, is a spook in the machine, is that which is prior. It's that which all modern theory rejected when the modern world replaced the medieval world. Those theories are based upon the idea which recognizes even the existentialist project of the 50s and 60s. And this is that there is no essential foundation to meaning. They believe they begin with man in his predicament. And the only way to get out of that predicament is to change one's environment which creates the nature of that predicament. Heidegger's view is that everything is prior, everything is prior, and death is before you. And death, in accordance with essentially his religious nature, is what life is about. I would also say that all people zum Beispiel, wie die Kommunisten eine Religion haben, nämlich sie glauben an die Wissenschaft. Sie glauben unbedingt an die moderne Wissenschaft. Und diese unbedingte Glaube, das heißt das Vertrauen auf die Sicherheit der Ergebnisse der Wissenschaften, ist ein Glaube und ist in gewissem Sinne etwas, was über den einzelnen Menschen hinausgeht und ist also eine Religion. Und ich würde sagen, kein Mensch ist ohne Religion und jeder Mensch ist in gewisser Weise über sich hinaus, das heißt verrückt. In spite of our proud domination of nature, we are still her victims, for we have not even learned to control our own nature. Slowly, but it appears inevitably, we are courting disaster. There are no longer any gods whom we can invoke to help us, the great religions of the world suffer from increasing anemia because the helpful noumena have fled from the woods, rivers, and mountains, and from animals, and the god-men have disappeared underground into the unconscious. There we fool ourselves that they lead an ignominious existence among the relics of our past. Our present lives are dominated by the goddess Reason, who is our greatest and most tragic illusion. By the aid of reason, so we assure ourselves, we have conquered nature. But this is a mere slogan. Heidegger's primary, most, most essential criticism is that Western thinking, actually the entirety of Western thinking, after Heraclius, really, um, starting even with, with Plato, views the, the world as a collection of things. The theological problem here is that often God gets included as one thing among many. So you're asked to, to prove his existence as if he is one object among other objects, rather than the ground of objects. You can't really prove God's existence since he is why there could be proof at all. He is why he is the ground of things rather than a thing. Because we make these arbitrary divisions, and I think it's gotten worse as time has gone on. Nominalism has completely destroyed the concept of being, even destroyed the concept of a thing. Everything is arbitrary. The nominalist idea, nominalism is the ultimate separation of the spiritual realm from the material realm. You're very well known in the States for deconstruction. Can you talk a little bit about the origin of that idea? Avant d'essayer de, de répondre à cette right. question, je voudrais faire une, une remarque préliminaire sur le caractère totalement euh, artificiel de mm -hmm. cette situation. 
je ne sais pas qui regardera ce que nous sommes en train de, 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 de filmer ou d'enregistrer, euh, mais je, veux, je voudrais euh, souligner au lieu de les effacer ces conditions techniques. Euh, ne pas feindre euh, la, la, la naturalité là où elle n'existe pas. J'ai déjà commencé à répondre à votre question sur la déconstruction, parce qu'un des gestes de la déconstruction consiste en particulier à ne pas naturaliser, à ne pas faire comme si ce qui n'est pas naturel était naturel, comme si ce qui est conditionné par l'histoire, par la technique, euh, par l'institution, par la société, était une donnée naturelle. For Heidegger, for people like S.L. Frank, uh, Ferovsky, uh, there's this whole tradition of personalism and intuitivism, I really should say. Being comes first. Being is that which exists prior to the human will, arbitrarily selecting pieces of it and giving name, names to it. The intuitivist will say that, that being comes first. It's really the only thing that exists. We, of course, are a part of that. The difference between the self and the external world is also completely fraudulent. There's no reason to believe, whether you're secular or religious, that, that the creation of the human person, the human soul, is something radically different from the creation of everything else, including other souls. That's also an act of will. But in Heidegger's mind, even when you take this arbitrary collection of things, we call objects, and actually believe is, is all there is, Even that doesn't hold up the scrutiny. Because they're arbitrarily delineated from each other, they have a tendency to be fluid and to bleed into one another. But this is not a terrible thing. It just continuously reminds us that what is there is this totality of things. Whenever we claim to know an object, we're also claiming to be able to abstract it from everything else around it. The modern looks at a concept of a tree, and you could picture that in your mind as a separate thing with that has a bark and, and, and branches and leaves. The problem is, you know, that's a normal thing to do when you use that word. That's what you picture. And yet it's really a ridiculous concept because you know you can't separate it from the soil, you can't separate it from the entire ecosystem, you can't separate it from sunlight, you can't separate it from, from moisture, a million other things. That go into its uh, its maintenance. My, my topic is defined by by two Greek words, nostos and oikos. From the word nostos, we have nostalgia, denoting the return to the home, and it's the great theme of Homer's Odyssey. From oikos, we have economy, but oikos denotes the home itself conceived as a place of settlement to be defended against marauders and also opened to friends and guests. The most basic social needs and sentiments are summoned by these two words. And if we are now living in conditions of hypermobility in which no one is settled deeply enough or for long enough to enjoy the sense of home, it is not surprising that we are also living in a condition of intense nostalgia. We are constantly seeking for the place of rest, the refuge from change and stress and fleetingness, the condition in which we will be restored to ourselves. Some seek this place in the past, believing that we must return to a simpler and more tranquil way of doing things. Others seek it in the future, believing that the stress of competition and mobility is something to be overcome. Few, if any, find the place of refuge in the present. We're born into a world that's already been divided up into these objects, whether it should be or not, including now individuals separated one from another. First, my philosophy is based on the concept that reality exists as an objective absolute, that man's mind, reason, is his means of perceiving it, and that man needs a rational morality. I am primarily the creator of a new code of morality which has so far been believed impossible, namely a morality not based on faith. On or faith. Not on faith, not on arbitrary whim, not on emotion, not on arbitrary edict, mystical or social, but on reason, a morality which can be proved by means of logic. 
it is an act of will. It is an act really of almost of custom that one soul is taken, or one person, one ego is taken as different from another. Even though we know that in every aspect of life, even the most mundane, we need a community of people. We need a community of people to argue the fact that we don't need a community of people. Uh, the Ayn Rand uh, egocentric nonsense is refuted in the very fact that by uh, explaining it, you need an entire civilization, an entire history, an entire community to be able to create that universe of meaning that makes sense out of these arguments. Now, here's the problem. Heidegger um, gave a speech in 1933, the, um, the, the self-assertion at the German University. This is one of his National Socialist speeches. And he says what he means by this Dasein. At its best, at its best, it is the shared meanings that only the nation can create. When I mean nation, I'm referring to this world, this context, this matrix of shared meanings, a language. And when I say language, I'm referring to something far broader than just, you know, syntax and vocabulary. An entire world of gestures and rituals and understandings where every little thing we do can be interpreted by someone else uh, in a way that most people will understand. To have a concerted rebellion, you have to have a foundation for the concert. Concert, working together, well, what is that based on? This has been the problem with Marxism and anarchism. Uh, for, for a very long time, and it has never been answered. I think it's very striking, after the whole of our discussion up to this point, to list the fundamental ideas of Hegelianism that we've talked about, which Marx simply took over and incorporated into Marxism. Among these are, first, the idea that reality is a historical process. Second, that this process changes by uh, a, a dialectic movement, dialectical change, historic dialectic. Third, that it's all going towards a goal. Fourth, that that goal is a conflict-free society. And fifth, that until we get there to the conflict-free society, we're condemned to remain in one form or another of alienation. Now, all these absolutely central ideas of Marxism were taken over lock, stock and barrel from Hegel. One has to say that there's one huge difference, and it's this, that whereas Hegel, as we've been saying all along, was an idealist, and to Hegel all these things were seen as happening to mind or spirit, to Geist, as you said, in the case of Marx, he saw all these things as happening to something material. Marx was a materialist. But the whole pattern of ideas remains the same. It's as if Marx has taken over a great long set of equations from Hegel, substituted a different value for x in the equations, matter instead of mind, but kept the whole set of equations in every other respect the same. At this point, there was a materialist reaction. One of Hegel's main, main followers was Karl Marx. Right. who believed in dialectical materialism. This is preposterous. Anyone who understands what he Hegel said about the dialectic knows that it's completely incompatible with matter. We're talking about Geist. Right, he was spirit. all about the soul and the Geist, and then Marx takes... Vernunft. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with matter. You can't have dialectical materialism. And you can see it, for instance, in Marx's materialist conception of history, the key thing in Marx's thought, where history develops by the economic base, the material side, the forces of production, as dominating the mental, so that our ideas, our religion, our politics, all flow from the kind of economic structure that we have in our society. There are two towers joined by an atrium. The two towers wouldn't be able to stand on their own. Two partners stabilize each other, and together they form one tower. So you could say that reflects European monetary policy. <laughs>
you can't build society on a negation. Uh, whether it be Marx, or Engels, or Lenin, or Trotsky, it was nothing but a negation. Society was allegedly built on this notion that capitalism, the way they defined it, or an odd way that they defined it, was the root of evil, it's exploitative, and then workers, again, define in a very odd way, um, need to overthrow it with violence and install a regime that will rule in the interests of that class. Nothing further than that is ever mentioned. In the most vague general sense, they'll talk about, you know, a, a worker being able to, to be the jack of all trades. You know, Lenin says uh, the final stage will be when all production is absolutely voluntary and pretty much anyone can do anything. We all have all the skills necessary to work in, in different fields at the same time. Very, very vague, very kind of stupid. Karl Marx, for all of his writings, never talks about what the future society is going to be like. It's all negative. So what does that mean? It generally means that there is a secret agenda. You talk about Marxism today, they only talk in, in, in negative terms. They'll talk about capitalism, but never talk about their own future agenda. And if you bring up the Soviet Union or North Korea or anything like that, they'll simply say, that's not really socialism. Which, by the way, you shouldn't let them get away with. That's a completely arbitrary way of thinking. Well, that's not really socialism. Well, it's okay, then our situation here isn't really capitalism. If it's that easy to do. So what you, what you see here, here are basically two parallel tracks. And so if I can, how can I symbolize this, this relationship? Uh, Balzac is walking through the streets of Paris in the 1830s, and there he sees Heinrich Heine and Jacob, or James Rothschild, walking arm in arm through the streets of Paris. Now, from a Marxian perspective, if you're gonna say that a revolution is based on class conflict, this makes no sense whatsoever. The richest man in Europe walking arm in arm with the pre premier Jewish revolutionary from Germany. Uh, that doesn't make any sense uh, from a Marxian point of view, but it does make sense from an ethnic point of view. Because they're both Jews. And they both sense this, what do, what do they have in common? They have this sense of hatred toward uh, Christian culture. Uh, and they're both working, so, so what you find after a while is that both capitalism and communism are both working to destroy Christian culture, wherever they find it. So a later manifestation of the same thing would be Jacob Schiff and Trotsky. This new economy is not dislocated, as the 19th century socialist imagined, but unlocated. But it is for this very reason that it troubles us. Economic activity has become detached from the building of communities. We do not know the people who produce our goods. We do not know under what conditions they work, what they believe in, or what they hope for. We do not know the people who distribute those goods to us, except as celebrity CEOs of Walmart, McDonald's, Calvin Klein, and so on. People who seem miraculously to escape all liability for the goods that they sell so as to float on clouds of profit above the stock exchange. Local stores and local producers are successively bought up or driven out of business by the anonymous chains. And when a community tries to defend itself against the intruding giant, it finds that all the cards are stacked against it and that yet another anonymous agent, the abstract consumer, has already declared a preference for a shopping mall on the doorstep. people who are illiberal can understand the shock in liberal intellectual elitist circles of a man like Heidegger joining the Nazi party. This man of supreme intellectual gifts dwelling alone in his Shavian hut in the woods, dwelling on the ontology of death in life, in death in life, in death in life, you see what I mean, joins what they consider to be a sort of barbarous wrecking crew. And they're appalled. They're utterly morally appalled. And since the war, people have not really known what to do with Heidegger at all. Uh, as George Steiner said, 
one of, if not the most advanced theoretical mind of the Western civilization in the 20th century, adopted this particular course. And he did it because he believed that you cannot have a society where death has no meaning, because life has no meaning. And you cannot have a society which bases itself upon the absence of the religious urge. However you define that urge, and whatever system you use. Because if you do the reverse, you will end up with a society which has two values beyond subsistence, shopping and fornication. What Heidegger is talking about, what we're talking about in terms of ethnic nationalism, is a living, breathing culture. It might be dying, it might be very, very sick, most people may be completely ignorant of it because of bad education and, 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 and you know, uh, awful surroundings. But we know what that culture is. We know what Christian culture is in depth. We know what German culture is in depth. We can go on and on about it. We can talk about every little family uh, uh, artifact. Socialism can't do that. Socialism refuses to do that. Therefore, the only thing that I can conclude is that socialism in the, in the Marxist and Leninist sense was not about labor. It was all about negations to remove one ruling class so that another ruling class can come into existence. That new ruling class could only exist if there is constant warfare. The most cohesive um, group, no matter how small, will always dominate. This country isn't yours. It never was. And this ruling class disproportionately Jewish, but there's certainly other elements as well. And the Jews, of course, always speaking as a completely different language, in literal, literal sense and a figurative sense, have always benefited from this kind of social breakdown. It's because we're talking about the creation of chaos. The purpose of creating chaos, suggestibility, the destruction of all institutions, and the maintenance of this constant chaos. This is what Trotsky means by permanent revolution. Without constant chaos, there's always a threat to the Jewish ruling class in the Soviet Union or anywhere else that the Goyim might realize that they have a lot in common and they are losing a lot. <laughs> it's a kind of utopia, just the fact that the whole world will mix up with each other, that in, I don't know, 70, 80 years, there will be no white people anymore and only cappuccino colored people. Well, but that's the only it's way. That's, this is the if only this solution. Is, my, yeah, my way of yeah, mix up. It's yes. our only hope. It's our way out of this. Yes. It's going to take some time. But it's really the only way. This, this sort of Singaporean model where everybody's so mixed up that you really don't know who to hate because yeah. everybody's so hopelessly intertwined. They are the only ones who are cohesive and have a strong identity where everyone else is reaping the, the pathological rewards of this intense alienation. They're pushing around too many people. Well, why would the President of the United States pay attention to that model? They are strong. Strong in what sense? They are controlling many things. Controlling what? Newspapers. Medias. Your Majesty. Banks, finances, and I'm going to stop there. The Europeans killed six million Jews out of 12 million, but today the Jew Jews rule this world by proxy. They get others to fight and die for them. He went on to say, but the Jews have become arrogant, and arrogant people, like angry people, will make mistakes, and there may be a window of opportunity for us. Uh, I'm stating facts. I'm willing to say that again and again that this is what has happened. Anti-Semitic and racist that was called well, by many governments this and people around the world. This idea about anti-Semitism is created by the Jews themselves. We cannot say anything. So we began talking about Heidegger, we began talking about the idea that he really did have a future in mind. It wasn't just abstract theorizing about being and, and objects versus this fluid um, uh, integral whole that we don't really have access to that Kant keeps us from. That was a big part of it. But there has to be a payoff for this stuff. Abstract theorizing doesn't come out of nowhere. Abstract theorizing has to have a payoff. It has to be, we have to, you know, have some real social or scientific 
uh, reasons to even care about this stuff. And he says very clearly that this community that we're thrown into is ethnic. The criterion of a just wage is not how far down you can drive it. It's not a commodity like any other commodity that's a function of supply and demand. It is a function of the family. And so the criterion of a just wage is whether you can, a man by himself can support a wife and children on his salary. In order to have a world, in order to have this, this pre-created universe of meaning that we're all born into, that we didn't make. You have to have one language in the broad sense. You have to have a general fundamental sense of moral unity. You can't have a debate with someone unless you agree on the fundamentals. You have a level of agreement, and then above that, you may have a debate as to how to reach a certain good that you all agree on. You can't have civic association. You can't have a debate. You can't have a discussion unless the fundamental issues have already been solved. You can't debate fundamental issues because there's no ground of agreement. You're not even speaking the same language in that case. Debate implies, and it always has implied, a social, ethnic, generally religious and moral unity among people. That's the foundation. That's the foundation that keeps you from um, not you know, debating, but killing each other. The concept is, is ultimately that this universe has to be ethnic. It has to be a world of concepts that is mutually understandable by everyone in it. The more foreign elements you bring into it, the less meaning exists. The ruling class is bringing in as many completely foreign elements as possible. You're not talking about immigrants here. You're talking about absolute aliens. You know, people who, who have absolutely no place you know, the society, the cultures are so different from each other, the languages are so different from each other, but that's the point. The purpose is, is to destroy. And uh, we think we are able to be born today and to live in no myth, in, without history. That's, that's, that is a, a disease that's absolutely abnormal because man is not born every day. He's once born in, in a specific historical setting with the specific historical qualities and therefore he is only complete when he has a relation to, to these things. It's just as if you were born without eyes and ears uh, when, you are born, when you are growing up with no connection with the past. From the, natural, from the standpoint of natural science, you need no connection with the past. You yes. can wipe it out. Yes. And that is, that is a, a, a mutilation of, of, of the human being.